Thank you, everybody, and, 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 and hello. Um, so, so hi, I'm, I'm Richard Brown. I'm Chief Technology Officer at R3. We're the software firm behind the open source blockchain Corda, uh, which has been around for several years now, first open sourced in November 16. Um, and as I'll go on to show, uh, hopefully demonstrate, um, is, is, is gaining more and more, uh, more, and more adherence, uh, both within the financial sector and beyond. Um, for, this, for this talk, before we get onto the panel that, that Colin's going to moderate shortly, um, I've set myself three challenges. Um, and as I look across this audience, I wonder whether they're actually quite ambitious. Because the first challenge I've set myself is to convince you, even those of you who are here for the public blockchains and the tokens and the crypto economics, convince you that enterprise blockchains are real. They're not just glorified databases. And not only that, they're actually quite interesting. So that's my first challenge, to leave you um, actually agreeing with me that that's the case. And if you don't, ask questions in the Q&A or come and um, see me afterwards, because I will have failed if I haven't convinced you. But then I want to go further. The second thing I want to do is convince you that there really is something you should be paying attention to with Corda. If you're a business manager or founder in the room who's looking to build your next project, issue your next STO, or help a client solve a business problem, I want you to leave this thinking, you know what, maybe I need to get my engineers to go look at Corda. And if you're an engineer in the room, I think by the end of this, I want you on GitHub looking at the code, because you may be quite surprised by what you see. So that's my second big challenge. But actually, my third challenge is probably the hardest. I'm going to try and say nice things about the competition and not say anything nasty about any of them for 30 whole minutes. And that's probably going to be the hardest thing. But I have to do that because at the end, I want to talk about interoperability. I want to make a case that we've I think we've overcomplicated things in the industry. We've tried to solve too many problems at the same time, and now there are just too many, too many complex and overlapping interoperability solutions, and we need to make things much, much cleaner, simpler, and, and easier so we can make progress. You know, there won't be one blockchain to rule them all. There will be several, and we have to figure out how we work together in, in a simple way. So, Make the case for enterprise blockchains. I think there's something genuinely different, but also interesting happening in this space. And I'd like you to share the same passion for it that I have, and those of us at R3 have, and, and some of our competitive firms. Explain why Corda works the way it does, and, um, and encourage you to go take a look at it as an example of an open, open source enterprise blockchain, and then make the case for interoperability. OK, so first, the case for enterprise blockchains. And the way I thought I'd kick this off is, Imagine you're a computer scientist who has been asleep for the last 10 years. Um, pretend you know nothing about economics or finance, and you don't know anything about blockchains. You've been asleep, and then one day you wake up, and somebody shows you a full Bitcoin node, so a fully validating Bitcoin node. Someone gives one to you. You've never seen this before, and you look at it. Yes, you might be interested in this new form of money, it's particularly if you have an economic or political bent, perhaps. Um, you may find that interesting. You may play with it. But as a computer scientist, you'll notice something that perhaps many of us have noticed and, and then kind of overlooked or forgotten. You'll notice something quite remarkable. You say, hang on a sec. Here is a piece of software that is controlled by me, running on my computer, which is connected to or communicates to thousands and thousands of other copies of the same software across the world, run by people I don't know, I don't trust. Maybe I want to transact with them, but I don't necessarily trust with them. It's talking to all these other copies of the software. And even though there's no central party in charge of it, there's no identifiable person who's controlling this, I know within some bounds that I can define, I know for sure that what my Bitcoin node is telling me is what all those other people's Bitcoin nodes are telling them. You know, we kind of take that for granted. That's, how, you know, that's what got us also excited, this, this new approach to consensus, these, these new blockchain networks. But when you look at it for the first time through fresh eyes, it's truly remarkable, you know, this new way of building distributed systems um, or, a, or a new lens on, on the old consensus algorithms that allows you to build a system that you, or own a system that you control, that you own, that is in consensus with other people you don't know and don't trust, and it does so without an identifiable third party. You know, that's, that, that by itself is, is really interesting. So when we began our journey as R3 uh, back in 2015, Back then, we were a consortium of financial institutions. We were not the software firm we are now. We were more of you like a consultancy, a collaboration, and a consortium. And, and one of the challenges we set for ourselves was, in addition to the opportunities around perhaps custody and trading and, 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 and working with cryptocurrencies and blockchains in the traditional sense, 
what are the other opportunities this technology might present to large regulated institutions, banks initially, um, other companies um, beyond that? It, what might the opportunities be? And it was that, it was that tantalizing um, you know, insight, if you like, this idea of computers run by different people who don't trust each other, but who want to transact, but without third parties who are completely in control. It was that tantalizing prospect that really got us thinking and led to where we are today. Because what we realized was, and it's kind of obvious now, but it has to be said, what we realized was, if you could build networks of computers that are deployed to a whole industry or to a whole market that are controlled by their owners, so they can run their accounting and report to their regulators, so each, one, each person has their, each firm has their own computer, but if you could deploy them or design them in a way that they were guaranteed to be in consensus, so I knew for sure that what I see is what you see, that could be extraordinarily powerful. Now, of course, the obvious point might be, well, isn't that how computers work today anyway? You know, haven't, haven't 50, 60 years of the IT industry already solved that problem? But of course, the answer is no. You know, we've spent 50 or 60 years in the IT industry helping individual companies optimize their operations. You know, most modern, efficient companies have been optimized beyond belief by the application of information technology. But the interactions and communications and transactions between firms are still remarkably inefficient and error prone. And it's because the way we've built these systems, we've kind of micro-optimized. We've optimized within the firm, not across the firm. So we end up with this stylized picture here, where you know, I've got my computer that I record a loan or a trade or any kind of record in. You record your, your, um, your records in, in your computer, but they're not guaranteed to be in sync. You know, I think that you owe me a million dollars, maybe you think that you owe me 999,000. We have to reconcile, we have to check, and we spend a huge amount of time bringing systems that should be in synchronization into synchronization. So the kind of like the breakthrough, if you like, was actually, maybe there's a time for a fresh look, maybe there's a time for fresh eyes. Perhaps we could apply some of the insights from this new world. Not all the technology, not all the ideas. This is a different problem we're trying to solve. But maybe we could apply some of these insights to take a go at something really quite extraordinarily ambitious and see if we can begin to optimize entire markets by bringing their systems into synchronization rather than just optimizing individual firms. Getting to a point where you know, participants in a trading network, participants in a market know for sure that what I see is what you see. So when I look at my computer as a, you know, as a, as a lender and you look at yours as the borrower, we know for sure that we're seeing the same things. You know, if we could achieve that, maybe it would be a step change in, in efficiency. That would be, the, you know, there would be like an optimization we could achieve, important but not particularly exciting if we're being honest. But perhaps that would enable a second thing, which is the final line of this chart. Maybe it would enable new business opportunities as well. Because if I, as a business owner, as, as somebody working inside a business, know that when I'm looking at my data, looking at my systems, if I know for sure it's accurate, it's correct, it's the same as what my counterparts and competitors are seeing, then I can transact with more confidence, with more speed, and I know my activities will be recorded quickly and efficiently by my counterparts. So I can transact better with confidence, and then they can transact in turn. You know, maybe we can finally take advantage of some new opportunities as well. And as I'll come on to argue a bit later, this world may in the future re-coincide with the public blockchain world as we discover that we've both independently been building systems to move towards tokenization of a huge amount of assets. The, 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 the public blockchain world using their approach and the enterprise blockchain world doing it through this ability to transact directly with certainty. But I'll come on to that a bit later. So that, I think, is, you know, is, is, is the opportunity that faces us. This is, the thing that, this is the thing that got us excited in 2015 and 16, this idea to build you know, new applications for markets rather than applications for individual firms. However, there was kind of, an, kind of, like a, kind of small but somewhat annoying problem. And that problem was, once we'd realized that this opportunity existed and that perhaps we could go and try and build you know, applications that would work this way you know, to optimize the, insurance, the reinsurance market or the syndicated lending market or whatever, whatever it was, there was this minor but somewhat important problem, which is the technology that had got us so excited, these platforms that we had been evaluating, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the others, they were not designed to solve 
that business problem. You know, the creator of Bitcoin, you know, Nakamoto, didn't wake up one morning thinking, you know what I want to do today? I want to take some costs out of the banking sector. You know, that wasn't what motivates the, the Bitcoin community to make life easier for banks. That isn't what that technology is for. So we're kind of in this weird situation where we've been massively inspired about, by, in, into thinking about a new way to solve problems, but the technology that had us inspired us was not designed for that. It, it was not there to solve the problem. And, and to show you what I mean, I'll just give a few examples. You know, if I do a transaction with any one of you in this room, who else needs to know about it? Well, no one. It should be private to the two of us or anybody else who needs to validate it or rely on it. You know, it doesn't make sense that I would share that information with everybody. Yet, of course, that's how public blockchains had to work back then. It was because of the, you know, the threat model they worked, um, worked, worked, worked against and the problems they were trying to solve. That's, that was the right solution for their problem, but it wasn't the right solution for business. Similarly, you know, in business, I need transaction finality. I need to know that when I'm told a transaction has confirmed, that it really has, and that I won't discover a few days or minutes later that my confirmed, traction, my confirmed transaction is now unconfirmed. You know, I can't deal with that. I can't, I can't explain that to a business person, how their transactions could go backwards. You know, I, need, um, I, need, I need privacy, I need transaction finality, I need my transactions processed in real time. I need my transactions or my data and my applications to be, to be writable and understandable by, by business developers. You know, there are tens of millions of people who can write in languages like Java and C Sharp, you know, the typical languages used by businesses. To be able to change the world and deliver the vision we have, those kinds of people have to be able to write these applications. If we have to rely on everybody going to Professor Gunsira's class at Cornell or somebody getting a PhD in um, sort of advanced security techniques to write Solidity code safely, we're never going to make the step change we need. So we needed a platform that was easy to use by people of average skill, not just the geniuses. So for all those reasons, we realized that we were going to have to embark on the journey to build the platform ourselves. And that's what led to the, the journey, the, the, that's what led to Corda, a platform that was designed to, it looks just like a blockchain, it works just like a blockchain in many ways, but it's intended to allow business developers to write applications that are deployed to whole markets, to whole industries, to automate and improve their businesses, but in a way that can be easily written, can talk to existing systems, offer transaction finality, offers privacy, and allows them transactions to be processed in real time. So that's what, so that's what we started to build. Um, we open sourced it in 2016, and that was, that was not out of a great act of, um, it wasn't a great act of generosity or, um, or, any, or uh, anything like that. It was just cold common sense. The only platforms we believe that will be successful are the truly open ones. You know, there are huge network effects. People need to see these platforms are open and, um, and, and available for everybody. So it made good business sense to make it open. So it brought us to Corda. You know, we designed it for business, um, and now what we're working on is the second point here, which is to build the biggest ecosystem possible. Because you know, we started with a collection of banks who told us what this thing needed to be. But of course, we're only going to change the world, as I just said, if there are large numbers of different firms, startups, software vendors, systems integrators, building the applications. So we've spent a lot of time over the last year, last two years, building this ecosystem. And if you go to a website like marketplace.r3.com, you'll see the hundreds of firms who are building on top of this. And the promise we make to them is, we just build the platform, we don't build the applications, that's for you, we're not gonna compete with you. So it's very clear how people can um, serve their customers and build their business. And the final point I wanna make on this, because this is kind of like, this is kind of like the nice feeling as, as an engineer, we designed this for finance. You know, we were looking at a really narrow set of problems in financial services, and then kind of one day we woke up to discover that people in lots of other industries had discovered it and decided it was right for them. The insurance industry, healthcare, oil and gas, government, all these different developers from around the world had independently discovered Corda, again, the beauty of open source, and, um, and decided it was right for them. So it's just kind of like one of those things that happens only once in your career where you think you've solved a small problem and then you actually discover you've solved a big problem. Um, but, it was, um, but, only because we only, but we only discovered that because we've made it open. So, so, so that's, you know, that, that's why we built it, and, and I think some of the reasons why people are, people are finding it useful. But I wanted to give an example, so I apologize for this slide. I mean, I guess some of this looks quite salesy, and I apologize for this, but I'm gonna talk to the underlying business problem here, because I think if I explain this one project, it also makes the case for enterprise blockchain in general. So Finastra, who are building on Corda, are a, um, a large financial software firm, and one of their products is focused on the syndicated lending market. 
Now, I didn't know anything about syndicated lending until this project came along. And it's an absolutely fascinating market because it's, I think it's, it's emblematic of a lot of markets in the world because it's inherently decentralized. So syndicated lending is, is pretty simple. You know, if, I need, if I'm, a, if I'm a, an infrastructure company, I'm, you know, I'm building a new subway or something, I may need to borrow a billion dollars, $10 billion. No one bank, no one lender is going to lend me that money. It's just too risky. So, so what I do is I go to a bank and say, hello, Mr. Banker, can you find me a syndicate? Can you find me a collection of people who collectively will lend me that money? So this market is decentralized. I can go to one of any number of agent banks to set this up for me, and then they can go to tens out of thousands of lenders. So it's, there's, there's no one in charge of this market. There's no CEO of the syndicated lending market. It's point to point, it's decentralized, it's, it, it's, entirely, um, it's entirely flat. And as a result, it's not optimized. The individual firms run Finastra software, they run just fine. But the communication and the efficiency between these firms is very limited because there's, there's no common standard and there's no one in charge to, to make it all work. The insight that um, Finastra had was, well, hang on a sec. If we could, if we could implement some, some business logic on Corda that doesn't introduce a new third party, it doesn't introduce a new governance layer, it doesn't introduce a new sort of like government or, or CCP. If we could introduce some, some business logic that is d deployed by each of these firms, but on their own computers at their option, so that they can communicate with each other in a way that is guaranteed and reliable, we could massively reduce the cost of the communication, drive up the data quality, and, um, and make this market much more efficient to the point that we could then create an entirely new market for the secondary trading of these loan tranches. So start off by reducing some costs and then use that as a stepping stone to an entirely new market. So, so it's not just the boring cost saving, it's actually a new innovation as well. But, and this is the point, I don't think you could do this until enterprise blockchain came along because you needed software that could be deployed between all these firms that allowed them to trade in confidence and in consensus, but without introducing a new identified central party to, um, to, to take a slice and, um, and control everything. So I think it, it's just a nice example that the really, I think, genuinely think there is something new here. Um, now, when Joe Lubin of Consensus presented yesterday, he had one slide where he, um, he, um, he made some not very nice comments about Hyperledger Fabric, and he, and he made one comment about Corda as well. Now, I promise to be nice, so I'm not going to say anything about um, any of the other platforms, but one of the things he said was, um, the, reason you should, the reason you should use Ethereum is it's a big global network. It's not lots of separate private networks. And we actually agree with him. Um, we think deploying these private blockchains as standalone, small little private networks, we also think that that's nuts. I mean, the whole point of this is to save money, in, improve communication, make things more efficient. You know, we agree that if you deploy lots of private networks, how does that help? So just like him, we also have the set, we also have this vision of a global internet of Corda nodes. There's a global internet of Ethereum nodes, just as there's a global internet of Corda nodes. But of course, we're trying to do something slightly more ambitious, which is we're trying to link the world's businesses as well as, um, as, well as the small firms. And businesses run their software in secure data centers between multiple firewall layers. So it's only with, with Corda, I would argue, that you can square that circle. Because you, with, the, with the Corda firewall, which is one of the features we added to make this vision come together, you can deploy your Corda node you know, deep in your data center, integrating with your existing applications. And then a tiny bit of it, we used to call it the float, a tiny bit of it can float out onto the internet. And that's the hardened piece. That's the piece the bad guys are trying to hack into. That's the piece that terminates the inbound connections and validates that only the good guys get in. So it's a pretty simple design. But it was just one of these things we had to do, one of these things we did to make it easy to deploy this software for real while still getting the benefits you know, of a single shared global network. And it seems to be working. You know, um, I think one of the biggest decisions, one of the best decisions we made was to make the core quarter protocol open source. Um, this is a chart from, from Gartner from, um, from last year, and it will be interesting to see how it's changed um, this year. The inner circle is um, 2017, um, and you see what the most used technologies for POCs and early pilots were with um, enterprise blockchains. And it's quite interesting to see how it shakes out. So in 17, it's what you'd expect, mostly Ethereum and Hyperledger, and then the next biggest one was the proprietary blockchains, so the commercial blockchain platforms. That's what people were looking at in 17. And Corda was nowhere back then. We just open sourced it. People were getting used to it. But look how it changed in 2018. 
Ethereum still there, of course. So is Hyperledger. But now Corda has rocketed into third place. You know, it's firmly now one of the top three um, blockchain platforms. Noteworthy, of course, is the, end, the, the proprietary blockchain, you know, just as we predicted and, 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 on the, and which was the basis of our, of, of our work, the proprietary blockchains have massively um, faded down into the background. You know, the whole market now gets it, that it's the open blockchains um, that are going to be the ones that succeed. And like I say, I'm eagerly awaiting the um, 2019 results, um, assuming they go in the right direction. So, so that's where we are. Final point, and then I'll move on to interoperability. Um, I said that maybe the, you know, the enterprise world and the, open, the, um, um, the public world may come back together. And the first signs of this are, um, are an inter interesting deal, an interesting um, announcement that was made last month. Um, SIX, for those of you who don't know it, is the um, Swiss stock exchange. Um, they are um, you know, a huge, um, huge stock exchange. They've just set up something called the Swiss Digital Exchange, which is a huge investment in a brand new digital exchange for the issuance of digital tokens, tokenization of existing assets, the trading of these. You know, this is a really far-sighted um, visionary move by a, by a major exchange to, to move into this new digital world, if you like. Um, you can imagine you know, a future of STOs and things um, in, this, in, in this world. After an extensive evaluation, they've chosen to build that on Corda. Um, so we're working really closely with them. You know, we're delighted by this. But I think what it shows is, as, as, as we move from the world of ICOs to STOs, and we look at you know, what is needed from a regulatory perspective, business logic to ensure that the right people hold these things, the right reporting happens, I think more and more people will conclude it's platforms like Corda, not, ju not just Corda, but the enterprise blockchains that were designed for this, actually become a more attractive place to deploy these, these new issuances. So I really do encourage you and your teams to take a look at, um, if you've not been looking at the enterprise blockchains, including Corda, do take a look. Like I say, the insurance industry has pretty much consolidated their blockchain activities onto Corda, and, um, and we're making huge strides in, um, in North Asia. Um, if, you, um, if you're active in um, Tokyo, take a look at a new joint venture with, um, with SBI. Um, that there's big things happening with, with Corda across Asia, especially North Asia. But probably the best thing about working on Corda, um, and uh, actually it probably is, is our, uh, our lead DevOps engineer, his family bakes us a cake every time we have a Corda release. And, um, and we've had a lot of releases. This is the Corda 4 cake. So this, was, um, this cake was baked in February to celebrate the release of Corda 4. And the reason I wanted to mention that, apart from the fact it was a particularly nice, um, particularly nice cake, was that we had introduced one new feature that I think would be of interest to everybody, which is, which is an entirely new approach to upgrading contracts. You know, we already know that if we look at platforms like you know, Ethereum and Fabric, you can have contracts where the code is law and it's very hard to upgrade. Um, other platforms I mean, have abilities for like, the network operator to upgrade them. You know, there was a whole schism between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. What we've announced in Corda 4, and we think it might be useful in other platforms as well, is what we're calling a, a social approach to contract upgrade, where you, when, where you deploy your application or you deploy your contract, you can sign it in such a way that you can say a threshold of the following parties can sign to upgrade it. So if there's, say, 15 participants in a trading network, if eight of them or 10 of them sign an update, they are, that's sufficient to upgrade it, and you don't need any third parties, and you don't need to hard fork anybody else. So just like it seems quite small, but I think it's the absolute key to making it possible to deploy this software at scale when we know you need to deal with upgrades, you know you need to deal with bugs. OK, so so far, Hopefully, I've made a case that there really is something of interest in this enterprise blockchain space, you know, writing software to optimize industries to enable new opportunities. Um, hopefully, uh, those of you who didn't know about Corda have seen enough to think, actually, you know, we should go look at this. There's something a bit different and a bit, a bit new and valuable here. But there's a third thing we need to do, which is, you know, as much as I might like it, Corda is not going to be the only blockchain. You know, as, as Sarah and others on the panel earlier said, there will be several blockchains that um, get deployed widely. And we have to think about how the applications that run on top of them are going to talk to each other. And to do that, we kind of have to talk to each other. Now, I've been slightly guilty of being slightly aggressive in the past. You know, I said earlier I was going to say nice things, because I, I have put a few blog posts out recently that, um, that have upset people. I've said slightly mean things about Hyperledger Fabric. I've said slightly mean things about Enterprise Ethereum. And you know what? It's interesting to look back at what I'd written, because it turns out the two platforms I'd, I'd written about most turn out to be the other two in the top three. You know, 
this is pretty much, I think, where the end game is going to be for enterprise blockchain. We're going to see a world with a large number of hyperledger fabric deployments, a large number of Corda deployments, and we're going to see um, probably you know, one or two of the enterprise Ethereum variants um, get deployed. So that's the universe we need to think about for the early work on, on interoperability. The problem is, I think we've made it a bit too complicated. As I look at some of the protocols that have been proposed, it's almost as if they're trying to run before they can walk. They're trying to solve you know, big, big problems that we don't yet have. So I thought I'd just outline the approach we're taking in the, in the open source Corda community, because maybe that will be a useful approach for others as well. Now, I know I'm running low on time, so I'll go through this quite quickly. So I think there are some principles we should adopt. I think the first principle we need to adopt is deployments of the same platform should be able to talk together seamlessly. Now, of course, that seems obvious, but right now, if you deploy, you know, three, if there are three separate deployments of you know, one of these other enterprise blockchains, it's not a guarantee that they will seamlessly interoperate. You know, we, we have to make sure that our own platforms can talk to themselves. Second thing is, when we talk about interoperating between platforms, we should try and make it independent of the details. You know, I shouldn't have to know how, let's say, Ethereum works in order to interoperate with it. It should be hidden behind interfaces. We should try and simplify things that way. Um, we should probably define these standards in the open. You know, no more closed door meetings where you've got to be a paying member to, to get in. Um, I don't think that helps the industry. And the final thing is, you know, I think for enterprise blockchains, Finality is non-negotiable. We have to know that when someone tells us something is done, it really is done. So how are we doing this in, in, in the quarter world? We're taking it step by step. You know, so I'll talk you through, you know, how are we ensuring same platform interoperability? How are we ensuring that all quarter nodes, the internet of quarter nodes can talk to each other? What's the next step after that? Maybe it's one-way settlement instructions, and then how do we get to full DVP? So we launched something called Corda Network earlier in the year, and the Independent Governance Board um, held, its, held its first meeting two weeks ago. And I think this is going to be really important, because this is the global internet of Corda nodes. You don't have to join it. You can run your own private networks, of course. But those who do join this get an amazing advantage, which is you can deploy your network, you know, your solution for insurance, your solution for healthcare, whatever it is. But those nodes can connect to any other node on the network. You can run multiple applications. You can interoperate. You can move data between them as and when it becomes necessary, or with a common layer of governance where you know who, is, you know, who, the, who the voting members are. You have a clear, transparent process. All the documentation is online at corda.network. Uh, we think this is key to to ensuring that deployments of the same software can interoperate. Um, but if we then look at what people are doing on Corda, I mentioned, I mentioned marketplace.r3.com, what we see time and again is the biggest requirement they have right now is to settle transactions. You know, the, the, the end state of their business logic is, now I owe you some money, you know, so I need to pay it. But right now, you know, we, we talked about cash on ledger and CBDC in the previous, um, previous panel, right now, the money isn't on Ledger, the money is in existing bank accounts or you know, on, on other cryptocurrency networks. So what we need is the ability to make payments somewhere else, like I just said there. So, so what we announced last year is something called Corda Settler. And we probably gave this the wrong name because Corda Settler implies it's unique to Corda, and it's not. It's actually just a design pattern that says, let's agree everything up front so that when we make the settlement, it's guaranteed to work and there's no ambiguity about whether it happened. Um, we probably created, there's quite a bit of excitement created because the first integration we did was to the XRP network. There's now an integration we're working on with Swift GPI. So we've shown a cryptocurrency integration, we've shown a traditional integration, and it's open source, and, and you can add your own. Um, and then we can get onto DVP in the panel because I suspect there's a lot of disagreement there. So net net, I think enterprise blockchains they're really important. They are something genuinely new, and it is different to what the public blockchains are doing. You know, we're two parallel worlds with so much to learn from each other and so much to cooperate on, but also solving different problems. Um, I hope I've convinced you that there's something interesting in Corda. You know, we've taken a different approach, a slightly controversial approach in places, but it seems to be resonating. You know, moving from nowhere to third place, what being one of the biggest three uh, blockchain um, platforms, I think, is 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 an important deal. And interoperability. You know, let's let's. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll stop picking fights. I'll stop being nice to everyone. Let's figure out how we do this in a way that, um, that gets to the goal, which, we, which the true goal, which is solving our customers' problems. Um, and with that, I'll, um, I'll end and um, hand over to the panel. Thank you, everybody.